episode 125 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography addiction recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind them once and for all, and trust me, it can be put behind you, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com. There you will find a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to overcome pornography addiction. Again, that is pathbackrecovery.com. And please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. Now you can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook as well. That is new. Um, before now, I was just simply pointing people to Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist, which is there as well. So please go like them both. And if you have a minute and you have enjoyed some of the Virtual Couch podcasts, please do me a favor and uh, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. And feel free to share a podcast if you feel that the topic has helped you or that it might help somebody that you care about. So let's jump right to it. Today's topic is how to navigate a faith journey. And even a couple of years ago, I kind of referred to these more as a faith crisis. And this is not going to be reflective of any one particular faith, uh, one particular denomination, one particular type of religious view. But uh, I'm going to base this for the most part, though, on what I experience the most, which are people that are are really struggling with a faith journey through the Christian faith, um, whatever that Christian faith may be. And uh, but this these principles that we're going to talk about today can be applied to any what's considered an all encompassing belief system. So this could be any type of Orthodox Christian belief. It could be um, Judaism, Catholicism, Mormonism. Um, varieties of Protestantism. I guess a lot of different isms is what I'm kind of hearing coming out of my mouth. But enough with the intro. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the the data. So I get to give uh, this talk often. So forgive me, but I'm going to go, you know, sit back, relax. Right now, you're, for the most part, going to be sitting down in a pew. And uh, you are about to, let's just pretend I have now come to the pulpit. So uh, here we go. Um, here's what I like to start with. I typically like to start with a little joke. I'm not going to lie. You want to ease the mood a little bit. And, uh, and, and oftentimes I say, you know, and I get all serious and I say, you can't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes. And you've got a lot of concerned, serious looks going on, a lot of head nods. Because I'll say, when you do judge him, then you're a mile away and you have his shoes. Usually there's a little bit of a chuckle there, and uh, but then I like to jump right into the concept of empathy. And if you listen to any of the podcast episodes I've done in the past, um, empathy is something that I am very big on. So empathy, empathy or the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, not to be confused with sympathy, which is feelings of sorrow or pity for another's misfortune. I often like to give the example of coming across someone and you see them and they are down in a hole. They're down in some sort of pit. That empathy, well, actually, let's start with sympathy. Sympathy is walking by saying, I am so sorry that you're down in that pit that looks horrible. You don't look like you're doing very well, and it breaks my heart that you're down in that pit, but I got some things I have to do, and you move on. Empathy is jumping down in that pit and saying, all right, tell me what you're seeing here. What's this like for you? When you're in a pit, what are your thoughts? When you see the the, the walls around you, what are your experiences with uh, with big walls of dirt in front of you? You know, what is this like for you? And as a matter of fact, I had a I had a client in a few nights ago, and they were and I loved this honesty that they were telling me that um, they were telling me that they were trying to understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. And when they got to empathy, they were even saying, I mean, so that's the thing where you know, hey, I know what you've been, I know what you've been going through because I've been through that myself. And, and I, again, I was so grateful for their honesty, but that's a slightly off because truly empathy, if you are, you know, we don't know exactly what something is like for someone else. I've had someone sit across from me and say, Hey, I've been there before. I know what you're going through. I, I, I have been where you are as a parent and, and it's all I can do to not just say, you know, so you know exactly what it's like for me at that point, whatever it was, my 45 years of the experiences that I had had at that time, again, this was a few years ago, and uh, parenting my particular child who is, you know, who is the birth order of whatever that is within my family, who they, that child has had the experiences that they have, that they have reflected onto me as a parent and the way that I've interacted with my spouse as a, as a parent and as a, as a partner. Um, if you're kind of still hanging with what I'm saying there, it's like no one, literally no one can understand exactly what we're going through. So having empathy for someone is trying to get in that pit and understand what that's like for them. But to tell somebody that I know exactly what you're going through because I've been there before um, doesn't, you know, that's why we don't get that. Oh my gosh, you're right. You do get it. I mean, we may understand a little bit more. We might be able to, but again, it goes back to that. We may be able to try and empathize with someone, but to truly say, I know exactly what you've been through. 
is is not something that is uh, is accurate or at times very productive. So so I like to talk about empathy versus sympathy in that way. And now again, you're sitting in a pew. I'm sorry, you're in my congregation today. So so this is the part where I will go into the the concept of uh, coming from a Christian background that we know that uh, that that Jesus atoned for our sins, for our transgressions, and sometimes I think we don't pay enough of attention about how that atonement works with sorrow, with grief, with feelings of iniquity, when we're sad, when we're lonely, we talk about that atonement or that Christ was there to uh, work for our sins, but not for our sorrows, grief, loneliness, that sort of thing. Um, you know, sometimes I'll even go into the, you will talk about, I'm bald. I mean, you know, so no surprise there. When I was in high school, I had bangs. I even carried a comb in my pocket for Pete's sake, but I had a high forehead as the kids called it. I go off to Kansas State. I try to play baseball. I wore baseball hats. Every time I took my hat off, I swear I lost another clump of hair. And that stuff drove me crazy. And I remember that there were times where it really bothered me. Um, you know, and that was that thing where uh, no one knows quite what that's like. So when people would then say the, oh my gosh, look at you, you know, you, you're losing more hair. Well, you know, as a 19 or 20 year old uh, young man, that was rough. I mean, there wasn't a lot of empathy there. Um, so it's like, no one truly knows what that's like now, the point where I'm at now, I don't care. Um, as a matter of fact, let's stay in this Christian realm. There's some stuff that talks about the resurrection and where every hair will be restored to your head. And at this point, I don't know what I would even look like with hair on my head. So quite frankly, um, I kind of want to know if I can just go ahead and keep my bald head might be, you know, I don't think anybody's going to notice me if I have a big thick head of hair. But, but the only reason I point that out is no one is going to understand what that's like. You know, even when somebody says, oh no, I'm losing my hair when they, when they show me at the age of 40, when they're starting to lose a tiny bit, they're like, no, I know what you're going through. It's like, Really? You know, you know what it's like to be a, you know, a 19 year old bald guy, you know, you know, hoping that uh, your, your girlfriend will still find you attractive. Um, and thank, thankfully she did. Uh, but so again, there's that concept of empathy. Nobody quite knows what it's like. And so with that concept of the atonement, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, the atonement covers those sorrows, those, those, that sadness, those feelings of loneliness as well. So there's a, there's a wonderful talk by a guy named, and I love this name, C. Scott Grow. That's really his name. C is the initial and then Scott Grow. He has a talk called The Miracle of the Atonement. He says there's no sin or transgression or pain or sorrow which is outside the healing power of the atonement. Um, another speaker, uh, a religious leader named David Bednar, said the Savior has suffered not just for our iniquities, but also, and I love this, the inequality, the unfairness, the pain, the anguish, the emotional distress that has so frequently beset us. There's no physical pain, no anguish of soul, no suffering of spirit, no infirmity or weakness that you or I will ever experience during our mortal journey that the Savior did not experience first. You and I, in a moment of weakness, may cry out, nobody understands, nobody knows, no human being perhaps does know, but the Son of God perfectly knows and understands it. He felt and bore our burdens before we ever did, and because he paid the ultimate price and bore that burden, he has perfect empathy and can extend to us his arm of mercy. And I love that, his perfect empathy, that he has perfect empathy. He can reach out, he can touch, he can sucker, literally run to us and strengthen us to be more than we ever could be and help us to do that which we never could through relying only on our own power. Um, one more quote, uh, an author that I love, Neil A. Maxwell said, having descended below all things, um, Christ comprehends perfectly and personally the full range of human suffering. Uh, there was a spiritual sung in yesteryear that has an especially moving and insightful line. Nobody knows the troubles that I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. So truly, Christ was exquisitely acquainted with grief as nobody else was. So if we kind of, again, you're sitting in my pew, you're in, the, in, in my congregation right now, uh, Christ is the ultimate example of empathy because he alone then has the ability to understand or share the feelings of each one of us. Um, and we know this concept or we have this belief because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. We believe that he literally has walked in our shoes. So um, so then I'd like to jump into, uh, there's a talk by a gentleman named Jose Alonso, and it's called Love One Another As He Has Loved Us. And so kind of bear with me here. So in this talk, um, uh, Jose Alonso begins by telling the story of a specific part of the Last Supper, specifically after the washing of the, of the feet, after the implementation of the sacrament, um, and after the traitor Judas Iscariot has left. From There's a book called Jesus the Christ, where the author James Talmadge wrote, as soon as the door had closed upon the retreating deserter, um, so that's Judas Iscariot, Jesus exclaimed as though his victory over death had already been accomplished, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Um, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have loved one to another. A little inside joke here. I think that would make a great hymn. Up to that point, the law of Moses had enjoined mutual love among friends and neighbors. But this new commandment, uh, so now all these apostles were now to be governed, this, this new commandment, which we would follow, was embodying love of a higher order. And, and so we're, I, I promise you we're kind of, we're getting to a point here. 
So they were to love one another as Christ loved them. So Christ-like love then, sure, that's a tall order, but it's a place to work from. It's a baseline. If anybody has ever been skydiving, and I haven't, but I've had a lot of people talk about this, you know, you can skydive anywhere in the world. You can jump from a few thousand feet, or you can jump from a height where you actually need an oxygen mask. But you have to have a plane to jump from. So Christ-like love, I like to say, that's kind of the jumping off point. It's where we need to work from. It's our goal is to uh, to work from that Christ-like love. So also, Jose Alonso said that this new commandment is to do something more, something greater, something more divine. So this new commandment, this invitation is summarized in the key phrase, as I have loved you. So how do we have Christ-like love? So I get back to starting in that joke that I talked about in the beginning of my, my talk about walking a mile in one's shoes, only the part without taking the person's shoes. So how do we now convey that empathy or that ability to share the feelings of another And again, not to be confused with sympathy or simply expressing sadness for somebody's problems. So I think a good place to look is how do we judge? So in the work that I do, I work primarily in a world full of judgments. People come to me to sort out what to do during difficult situations when, for many, they've spent most of their lives working from a place of worrying about being wrong or worrying about being judged or worrying about what other people think or worrying about making the wrong decisions. And I had even jotted down a couple of situations that come to mind from uh, where people from the outside judge. Um, Or they don't provide empathy or based on people's view of the situation without acting as this the savior does. And here again, we're trying to operate from this this new baseline of this Christ like love, this empathetic love or loving as he has loved. Um, I remember a person struggling financially due to a disability, but they were met only with condemnation because the vehicle that they were driving. I think I've shared this on a previous podcast. Um, but the vehicle that had been, had been, um, that they were driving was an incredibly nice vehicle, but this person was struggling a bit financially and no one wanted to take the time to learn, which I can understand. I mean, I I have empathy for where people are coming from, even with this, that, uh, this person, um, the, the vehicle had been given to them from a dying grandparent who had removed that individual from a horrific home life. And it asked that the individual remember the grandparent through the vehicle daily as they drove in it. And if you found yourself just saying, well, they still should have just sold it anyway, can you truly empathize with 30 years of that person's life that had led up to that point where they had been removed from a horrific situation and and basically saved by a grandparent who cherished a car who then said, take good care of this car. Think of me every day when you drive this car. Or an individual I once worked with who refused to vilify somebody for their past despite being vilified by that person. And it was because of their compassion or their empathy or their Christ-like love that they had because they knew what that person had been through. They knew, they felt like they could they had empathy on why that person chose to vilify a lot of people around them. So there was that truly Christ-like love. I remember I had a client once who had a traumatic brain injury, who, and uh, they were talking about having to wear a special beanie to play organized sports, only to find out that at every game, opposing players and parents in the crowd continually called for the removal of the beanie, never taking under, uh, time to understand that there could be a different view or reason of the situation. They thought this person was just trying to be difficult. Um, you know, I have a, I have a son who loves basketball. He's so much fun to watch. And, uh, a couple of years ago, we were playing in a rec league championship. We were down and, and again, from an empathetic standpoint, the, the group that he was playing with this team that we had loved, we've been coaching together since about first or second grade. And it was almost, it, it was culminating in this, uh, and essentially years of these, um, play these boys playing together. And this is gonna be the last time that they could play this organized rec league basketball game. And, um, there was a player, um, we had a player on our team who uh, was on the autism spectrum disorder. He was on that, uh, uh, he had autism. And, and there was another player on the other team who also um, was autistic. And as coaches, we kind of had an agreement that the two players would play at similar times in the game, they guard each other. And it was so much fun. It was a wonderful experience for the players, the crowd too. And as we got uh, further in the playoffs, there was an occasion where um, my son found himself switching then uh, onto this player. And and I have to tell you, we were losing. I mean, and we're talking, this was like Disney moment, championship game kind of stuff, and we're losing. And in that split second, he not only held back from playing defense on the player, but he quickly find himself blocking out another defender on his team who was closing in on this player. Now, the player shot the ball and missed, but I was so impressed at his compassion and understanding the moment. There were people in the crowd that were yelling at my son to, uh, you know, to block this kid's shot. And, and, and I was so grateful that in that moment, there was that empathy and understanding from my son to know that there were things that were bigger than the game at that point. So at each one of these situations, it would be so easy to simply judge. And at times, that would be removing empathy and then just move on. But I believe what uh, Jose Alonso was sharing in this talk is to continually nurture Christ-like love or compassion or love for a fellow man or or nurture empathy. 
Um, so, so where do I go from this? So we've kind of set the stage on empathy and, and understanding. But now what comes next is judgment. There's great information out, out in the world on the, the topic of judgment. Because, again, I go into this don't judge. You know, we, we, we try not to uh, guilt or shame or fix or judge. But uh, sometimes people feel that it's wrong to judge others in any way. And while it's true that you shouldn't condemn others or judge them unrighteously, we do go about our day making judgments of situations and people throughout our life. Um, again, back to this talk that I, that I will give from time to time. At that point, here I, 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 my wife and I had been at the mall. We were walking around. We were basically about to go buy tater tots at a place called Potato Corner, which is just amazing, these tater tots are. And there was a man who was sitting on a bench, and he seemed agitated. He was lifting up his shirt. He was poking at his stomach. And we both became hyper aware that there was, you know, was this a threat? Did we need to protect ourselves? Did we need to be ready to take action? Or, or was he simply someone with his own set of problems? The latter was the case. It was just somebody with his own set of problems, and we moved on. Yes, we judged him. We didn't condemn him, but we did judge the situation. And if we stay in the Christian realm, the Lord's given a lot of commandments that you can keep, uh, that you cannot keep without making judgments. For example, you know, he's uh, said, uh, beware of false prophets, or you'll know them by their fruits, or go ye from among, um, among the wicked. So we have to make judgments of people in many of our important decisions. I mean, even think about it, such as choosing friends or choosing career paths or choosing an eternal companion. So judgment is an important use of agency. And it requires a lot of care, especially when you make judgments about other people. But uh, remember that this is that part where we go back to empathy, that um, that God's the one who knows the individual's heart. And, and if you, again, if we're kind of staying in this Christian realm, is the one who makes final judgments on individuals. Um, the Lord even gave a warning in the judgment of others. It's like, with what ye judge, um, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, um, it shall be measured to you again. And this is the one that goes on to say, um, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider it's not the beam that's in thine own eye. And I love that. Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thine eye, but behold, the beam's in my own eye. You know, thou hypocrite, cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then you will see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. What does that mean? Um, that means that a lot of times we are judging others without seeing the things that we're doing in that situation. And those in that scripture, the Lord's teaching that uh, a fault we see in another could be like a tiny speck in that person's eye compared to our own faults, which are like an enormous beam in our eyes. And sometimes we're so focused on the our, on other people's faults when we should instead be working to improve our own lives. So, which always leads me to a quick side note, um, happiness. Why can it be so difficult? So, we know that the modern human mind has this ability to analyze and plan and create and communicate, but that the mind was not initially designed to be this feel-good device So we could tell jokes or write poems or say, I love you. Um, It's funny if you think back a few hundred years ago, even that, you know, there was a person who was called a court jester, uh, a.k.a. a fool. And it was his job to try to crack wise. It wasn't the fact that, like, you got some guy on a podcast, that'd be me right now, who's uh, already thinking to myself, man, I haven't cracked enough jokes here in in a few minutes. I got to make a get a little more levity into this or our people are going to not listen anymore. So our minds actually grew up in a way to help us survive in a world that was fraught with danger. Early on, our goal was to eat and drink and find shelter and procreate and replenish the earth and protect our family so we could survive and that we could, uh, that we could procreate and replenish the earth more. Our brain was more of this don't kill device. I always like to say that. But the better we became at anticipating and avoiding danger, the longer we lived and the more kids we had. So each generation of the human mind... Um, became increasingly skilled at predicting and avoiding danger. So now our minds were constantly on the lookout. We were assessing and judging, there's that word again, everything that we encountered, good or bad, safe or dangerous, helpful or harmful. But now it's not as much as animals or packs of thieves, but it's about we're, we're trying to judge are we going to lose a job? Are we going to be rejected? Um, are we going to get a speeding ticket? Are we going to embarrass ourselves in public? Are we? What if we get a terminal disease and a million of other common worries So as a result, we spend so much time worrying about things that more than often than not won't happen. But we also have this inherent need to belong to a group. And early on, if our group booted us out, how long would it be before you were devoured by wolves? I mean, sometimes literally. So how does the mind protect you from getting booted out? By comparing you to other members of the clan. Am I fitting in? Am I doing the right thing? Am I contributing enough? Am I as good as others? Am I doing anything that might get me rejected? So sounds familiar, right? So our modern day minds are continually warning us of rejection and comparing us to the rest of society. So no wonder we spend so much of our time looking for ways to improve ourselves. 
are putting ourselves down because we don't measure up because early on we only had a small group to compare ourselves to. And now thanks to the world of social media and everything else showing us people who appear to be smarter and happier and more successful, we're not only comparing ourselves to them, but to the person that we ideally think that we need or want to be. So when we look at it that way, it's almost like what chance do we have? So again, we get back into that world of, of judgment of where we are. We are judging others. We're judging ourselves. So it's time that we look at where we're at right now and what can we do about it? How can we be okay with where we're at and move forward? So, um, and, and again, I've got some podcasts on uh, happiness. So that's something that maybe we can talk about uh, or you can go back and look at some of those. And uh, But for now, we're back to this faith, faith journey. So years ago, I went to a training and at this training, um, and it, it stuck to me to this day, and I can't even necessarily remember who gave it at the time. Because at the time, I was just going to uh, get my hours toward licensure. But the training talked about three concepts with relation to a someone's faith journey. And it was um, or their relationship to, to the, the gospel. They were truth, beauty, and goodness. Now, these concepts are applied in a lot of different areas. They're called the transcendentals. You can find truth, beauty, and goodness all throughout uh, philosophy. Um, in this training in particular, this person talked about um, the, these truth, beauty, and goodness kind of in relation to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, where Stephen Covey even broke them down. And he said that uh, there's intellectual, which is learning, spiritual, which is spending time in nature and expanding the spiritual self, or social exercises, making social and meaningful connections. Those are the truth, beauty, and goodness. So at this training, and what I've often heard referred to is that truth, when you come to the concept of, of someone's faith or their faith community, uh, that truth oftentimes can be referred to as the doctrines of of one's church or beliefs or the scriptures. For some, this is where they find their true joy and passion. If you kind of sit back and think about your own congregation, there are people that can quote Bible verse and chapter. They can quote uh, things that they've heard in talks and, uh, and and everything can relate back to a scripture. They may even have photographic minds at times. And uh, for those people, truth is those doctrines, those doctrines of the church um, it's those scriptures. I've often heard beauty as described as the feelings that we may get at church or how maybe the Holy Spirit can testify through music or through uh, mood or through faith promoting story, through motivational speakers. Sometimes it can simply exude through a person's countenance. There are people that I can often think of where beauty was what was the most important thing to them in their uh, faith community. Um, I, I used to sit up on the stand in my particular congregation And whenever there was music being sung or music being played, there was this just beautiful older couple that would sit out in the congregation that just closed their eyes. And I know that some would look at them and think, oh my gosh, they fall asleep every time that music is played. But it was quite the opposite. I remember talking to uh, the gentleman once and he said that just he and his wife were so moved that beauty was what really spoke to them. And I remember going to a congregation once we were visiting uh, Oakland for a basketball tournament. My, My son had a game. And so we found a, a congregation that met early that morning. And uh, there was a woman there who was actually not of that congregation as well. And she got up and played just a, a piano medley of just some, some just um, primary children's hymns. But there were also a couple of hymns that I hadn't heard since I had gone to a vacation Bible school camp in Tennessee with my grandparents when I was maybe 10 years old and, uh, and I was moved to tears. I mean, I literally cried in that moment. And I remember just thinking, my goodness, you know, that, that was just touching. So that's the beauty. Goodness is often attributed to people, uh, people of the church or the church community. Goodness is being there for each other when somebody is moving out or in, when there's a service assignment or a welfare project. Sometimes goodness can be associated with taking meals to someone. Um, goodness is when somebody is maybe connected to the people of the church. So each of these three areas are an important part of the makeup of someone's gospel experience. So um, again, going back to looking at this as if Christ is the author of all three, truth, beauty, and goodness, yet there are times where we see our fellow man suffering, where we want to judge them from a particular point of view of what they quote, in my mind, I'm quoting this, should be doing, I always like to say we shouldn't should on people, that they should be doing more truth or more beauty or more goodness when one of those areas may be the area that they struggle with at that particular time. If people are struggling with the particular doctrines of their faith community um, or those areas of truth, then what I often do is try to get someone to focus a little bit more on what are the things that are important to them. Are they spending enough time with the beauty, with those uh, inspiring talks, those faith-promoting messages, um, music, beauty, 
Or are they spending a lot of time with the people? Again, noting, noting the goodness. And you can look at this as almost in any of these realms. So, you know, if for the individual who struggles, sometimes we get caught up finding fault or problems with one of these areas in our lives and we may neglect the other two, which can lead to discomfort. So me personally, here's what I like to get all vulnerable. I've, I've always struggled with my knowledge of scripture, of doctrine. And I know this. I accept this. Uh, this is the, I used to get up every morning and teach an early morning seminary class for eight years because it kept me or forced me to spend more time in this doctrine or these scriptures. Um, I try to sing in the choir because for me, I feel a very strong connection to the beauty of the gospel, to inspiring messages, to the words um, of, of speakers, of motivational speakers, to hear special musical numbers. Um, like I said, I, I even jotted down a note here where another another time we were in Southern California and uh, heard a, an amazing musical number on the cello and uh, again, this piano solo. But so when someone is struggling in a particular area, you can look at this in, in a variety of ways too. So if someone is more tied into the goodness, if they, if they, the goodness again, representing the people, and then they find themselves in a disagreement with a person, oftentimes they may leave their faith community when in reality, can they, can they dial in a little bit more to that beauty, the, the, the faith promoting messages or the music, or can they, you know, in that scenario, do they need to turn more to uh, scriptural passages that may inspire them? So we're all going to be a little bit different in this truth, beauty, and goodness journey. And so if we're having a struggle with one, then are we at least focusing on those other two to kind of keep us engaged or keep us committed? So, so that's one of the concepts that I like to talk about in a bigger picture of, of navigating a faith journey or faith crisis. But I hope that you've stuck with me this long because the true part that I wanted to get to is uh, this next point. So much maybe is like, why didn't I start with this, right? But so I love to kind of set out that truth, beauty, goodness in the first part. But what I really feel like is important to talk about or where I feel like people kind of um, where they connect the most is this concept of uh, stages of faith. And so if you have ever heard, um, what's the, there's a gentleman named James Fowler. And uh, this is the part where I probably should have had a little bit more of uh, James Fowler's um, background. But I know that Fowler was, I believe he was a Methodist minister, but he did a tremendous amount of work on researching stages of faith. And so I have a chart of James Fowler's stages of faith that I refer to often. And, it, and I really, I love this. I think it's just, it lays this out so well. So James Fowler wrote a book in 1981 called Stages of Faith. And he developed a theory of six stages that people go through as their faith matures. And what I love about it is it's based on Piaget's stages and, and also uh, Kohlberg, Kohlberg's stages of change. So these are two psychological principles or stages of change. And so the basic theory can be applied not only to those in traditional faiths, but those who follow um, alternative spiritualities or secular worldviews as well. And then uh, there was an, an author in 1987 who wrote a book called The Different Drum, and it's M. Scott Peck, who I love as well. M. Scott Peck wrote the book that I talk about all the time, that I oh, The Road Less Traveled, which is uh, the book that starts out life is difficult, but then uh, as soon as we understand that life is difficult, then we kind of can transcend that uh, the concept that life is difficult. The fact that once we realize that life is not meant to be easy, then it no longer matters. The fact that life is difficult, it's now what do we do with it, which I absolutely love that concept. But um, Peck offered a simplified version focusing only on the four most common stages of these James Fowler stages of faith. But I like to go into all six. So I'm going to make this somewhat brief. Um, the stages. So let's let's talk about this. So again, we've kind of laid the groundwork with this truth, beauty, and goodness. So already we may identify with a different area. Truth. We may we may identify more with these the, the gospel doctrines or the truth claims of a church or a faith community. And and if so, if something happens in our in our worldview where we're kind of rattled on those truth claims, first of all, are we spending enough time in the beauty or in the goodness? Or if we, if we run across problems within one of those areas, in the beauty, um, if, uh, if one of these people that we've relied on to provide these motivational uh, talks or experiences um, has maybe, you know, somebody that it has disappointed us, are we, are we spending enough time in truth or in goodness? Or if someone in our congregation has offended us, so again, the goodness part being the people, um, are we willing to throw out our entire experience because of, of someone offending us in that area of goodness? without you know, doubling down on some of the beauty or the truth parts of the of our faith community that we appreciate. With that said, though, now here's where I think we work through these stages of faith. 
So James Fowler stages of faith. Stage one is called intuitive and projective. This is a stage of preschool children where fantasy and reality often get mixed together. During this stage, our most basic ideas about God are usually picked up from our parents or society. Intuitive and projective faith um, is very, very young children. I mean, so this is basically where we are projective. We are projecting our beliefs onto our um, very, very small children, basically just saying, projecting, there is a God. There is, you know, th- there, there, here are these um, faith-promoting stories. Stage two, mythic and literal. When children become school age, they start understanding the world in more logical ways. They generally accept the stories told to them by their faith community, but they tend to understand them in very literal ways. When I'm talking about this mythic and literal stage, stage two, we're often talking about, um, I don't know, four to 12 year old. And this is where we can tell, we tell them there's a, there's, there's Jesus, there's God, there's the Easter bunny, there's the tooth fairy, there's Santa Claus. So again, mythic and literal children become school age and they accept these stories from, from those who are in authority, their parents, um, their faith community. And I love that in James Fowler's Stages of Faith, he says, a few people remain in the stage through adulthood. And I don't know why, but I often go to the of Mice and Men, and I think, who is it, Lenny? Where I feel like he probably lived a life in this stage two, mythic and literal. Here's where, here's where things get very, very interesting. Stage three, faith. Synthetic and conventional is the, is the name of the stage. So James Fowler said, most people move on to this stage as teenagers. At this point, their life has grown to include several different social circles, and there's a need to pull it all together. When this happens, a person usually adopts some all-encompassing belief system. However, at this stage, people tend to have a hard time seeing outside of their box, and they don't recognize that they're inside a belief system. At this stage, authority is usually placed in individuals or groups that represent one's beliefs, and Fowler argues that this is the stage which many people remain. And so we're going to work from this, and, and in Fowler's stages of faith, he talks about that people have a hard time seeing outside of their box. So I'm going to refer to stage three oftentimes as in the box or outside of the box. And I hope that it's not offensive. You can see the therapist coming at me, right? I wanted to say, and I don't want that to offend you, but if it does, I apologize. And I would, uh, and I have empathy for the the fact that that may offend you. But in doing the stages of faith work, um, bear with me here, because if we view stage three as in a box, it's an all-encompassing belief system. So in essence, if you look at any type of belief system, you really are kind of handing you, you know, when we are growing up, we're saying, hey, here's your belief system. It's an all-encompassing belief system. Here's the things that we believe. And here's the, you know, if we ask certain questions, here's the answers that we, that we agree upon. And so we are handing someone this all-encompassing belief system. And for many, again, Fowler identifies this, this is the stage which many people remain. Many people are very comfortable inside the box, the stage three box, the stage three faith. But I hope that now we've set the stage. Honestly, now you hopefully you can see where we're going with, we've laid out truth, beauty, and goodness. We've laid out empathy. We've laid out judgment. We've laid out all of these concepts that are hopefully bringing us to the point of where we're all kind of individuals, kind of. We are all individuals, and we all come to the table with all of the individual experiences that we have. If you've listened to any of the podcasts I've done in the past on acceptance and commitment therapy, then the only person who knows what it's like to be you is you. You have all of these private experiences that have led up to you. Nature, nurture, birth order, um, acceptance, uh, putting yourself out there, you know, attachment issues. All that is you and you only. And those that you and you only part has led to you um, even identifying with these various areas, truth, beauty, goodness, you know, kind of coming up into this stage three faith, which is a normal progression and now handed a all encompassing belief system. And so for many, this is going to work. But for some now is when we start to feel like, okay, but maybe there are some things that, that I don't necessarily agree with or that I want to explore or that I have questions about. And, and at times, those questions or that exploration is met with, hey, you know, you don't want to think that. You know, you, you don't need to worry about that. That shouldn't be important to you. But the problem is, it is important for some people. So this leads to stage four. This is called individuative and reflective. So what I get a lot of people in my office are people that are in this stage four faith. This is a tough stage, Fowler says, often begun in young adulthood when people start seeing outside the box and realizing that there are other boxes, and they begin to critically examine their beliefs on their own, and they often become disillusioned with their former faith. And here's the key that Fowler says. He says, ironically, stage three people usually think that stage four people have become backsliders, when in reality, stage four people believe that they are actually moving forward. 
So here's where we get the disparity. Here's where I get people in my office that are having these stage four faith questions. They're on this faith journey, or or oftentimes it's a faith crisis because they are now kind of coming up against the, the, let's just say, the sides of the box in stage three. And then when they try to make sense of why they struggle in stage three faith, they're often told that, hey, you know, don't worry about it, or you shouldn't worry about it, or you shouldn't have those thoughts that you're having. If you are, you might be doing something wrong. So a lot of times people, well, well well-meaning people in stage three faith will tell someone who is struggling in their stage three faith, who has possibly even moved on to stage four faith, they're telling them, hey, just you probably need to pray a little bit more, or you might need to read your scriptures a little bit more, or you might need to just come and do more activities at church. Very well-meaning. And again, for some people, that is going to work. Stage three is the stage in which most people remain in their lives. But for for many, many people, though, they hit that stage four, and then they want to talk to someone who is, is very well ensconced in a stage three type of faith or a stage three box, and they're told, hey, you're, you're not doing the right thing. You know, you're at an apostate. You're reading things that you shouldn't be reading. And stage four person is saying, okay, but just can we have the conversation or, or can't we talk? And that's the part often where there is the, 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 where people start to break away. So I get a lot of people in this stage four. So one of the first things I like to do is, is just let them know, you know, we can talk and, and I love this and I should be more prepared and I apologize. I'll have this in my notes, but, uh, you know, I did a podcast a little while ago on, in leading saints with, uh, my, my friend, Kurt Frankum. And it was one of my favorite podcasts I feel like I've ever had the opportunity to do. I am stalling now as I'm pulling up my phone. I'm just being very authentic. And I'm going to find in the Leading Saints um, podcast, there is one that he does where he talks about these stages of faith with a person who is currently serving as a uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, bishop. And it is such a good um, it is such a good interview. I'm going to stop. Let, you know what? I'm going to do this as I, I'm going to put this in my show notes and... Uh, Matter of fact, I should probably go through and uh, delete this. And now you're probably finding out that I did not delete it and I just wasted your time. But hopefully you will go find that as well. Leading Saints, the podcast. And um, this article that Kurt did with a, a current bishop for the LDS Church. And it is it is just fantastic because the, the whole point of the, the podcast is he tells Kurt that he also went on one of these, uh, like a faith journey, a faith crisis. And, um, and now he has come through that. And he's not afraid to have those conversations. That's the best thing that I love for him to say. And I feel like as a, as a therapist, that's what I get to do as well, as I, I want people to know that I'm not afraid to have those conversations. That uh, when someone says I'm having a struggle and, and they start to talk about the struggles that they're having, when, when people, here it is, okay, what a, what a delay. Um, This is uh, October 14th, 2018, Leading Saints podcast, What Every Leader Needs to Know About Faith Crisis, an interview with Scott Braithwaite. And Scott Braithwaite has a PhD in clinical psychology, and he specializes in marriage counseling at uh, Brigham Young University. And he's a presenter at BYU's Education Week, and he talks about these uh, stages of faith. He talks about not being afraid to have these conversations. So stage four, the person oftentimes wants to have those conversations. And so what I'm often trying to do is, is help someone move on to what Fowler calls stage five, conjunctive faith. Here's the problem. Uh, Fowler even says it's rare for people to reach this stage before midlife. This is the point when people begin to realize the limits of logic and they start to accept the paradoxes in life. They begin to see life as more of a mystery and they often return to sacred stories and symbols, but this time without being stuck in a theological box. So oftentimes in that stage three faith, people may have an experience that goes against that of their faith community. So they may struggle with a with a particular concept. They may have someone in their family who um, you know and uh, who who maybe comes out with a different type of lifestyle that goes against that faith community's lifestyle. But the but the person who is struggling in their faith um, still loves that person. They may they may have a disagreement about some of the things that they have always grown up believing in that stage three box, that stage three all encompassing belief system. So in stage four. You know, they're saying that this doesn't this doesn't fit well with me. And so they're they they are wanting to then kind of come from this place of anger. And a lot of times the people in stage three, again, feel that the person in stage four faith has um, has is, is is doing something wrong, uh, that they have become a backslider when the person in stage four is saying, no, I, I'm I'm I want to have these conversations. Stage five, we go back to that. People begin to see life more as a mystery. They, they start to accept the paradoxes of life. They start to see the good from their faith community. 
they start to understand the good the good things they've experienced growing up in a all encompassing belief system but they also understand that there are some limits of logic they are starting to see paradoxes in life that uh, they're seeing outside of maybe their box and they're seeing that there are other um, belief systems that they can appreciate or understand or that they feel like that that uh, that are also loving of other people. And uh, so people that get to this stage five, this conjunctive faith, they begin seeing life as a mystery and returning those sacred stories and symbols without being stuck in a theological box. They can find that the, they are not trying to dismiss all of the things that they grew up learning. And that's the biggest part where people start to find a problem. So people that are still in this stage three faith, maybe it's parents and they have a teenage child or a young adult child who is, is really pushing against their faith community um, that they grew up against. A lot of times the person in stage four feels almost like they have to just say, I, I don't like any of it. I didn't have any good experiences. And the person in stage three is about, what about these times where we, we, you know, we felt the spirit in our home or, or you did these things? And so stage five faith is getting someone to the point where it's really coming from more of a place of empathy. Of it's a, hey, I can understand those struggles that you had in pushing against your faith community. Those, you know, I can understand why you got to stage four. I can. I can understand. And I can also understand how difficult that is because of the wonderful experiences that you had in stage three. So stage five, when someone kind of gets to that stage five belief, it's they feel comfortable with their relationship with God. They feel they feel maybe that there's more empathy there. Um, and that the, that the person who does really understand them or know them best is, is their heavenly father, is, is, you know, is God the father. And that they may feel like at this point then that this is where the atonement is real. That this is where the only person who really understands what they're going through. And, and that, remember that atonement covers the sorrow. It covers the, the experiences that we've had, the, the loss, the grief, the sorrow, the sadness. And so that is true empathy. That's where that atonement really does speak to that person's individual experience. Um, I think it's important to kind of talk about stage six, although it's very brief. Stage six, Fowler calls it universalizing faith. He says, few people reach the stage and those who do live their lives in full service of others without any real worries or doubts. So oftentimes when people talk about stage six faith, they talk about Christ. They talk about Mother Teresa. They talk about Gandhi. They talk about Buddha. They talk about people who just lived their life in full service of others without worries or doubts. People that just knew that they were they were there to do good in the world and not to judge or shame others. Um, so I, I hope I went much longer on this. I hope that this makes sense. This is a podcast that I was wanting to do for so long, and I may even go back and do it again sometime. Because I think those concepts of truth, beauty, and goodness are so important. I think the concept of the atonement is, is so important. And then these James Fowler stages of faith. If someone is maybe someone who is stuck on truth, if they are only tied to the truth claims, or if, they, if that stage three all-encompassing belief system is what works for them, oftentimes they're going to hear these stages of faith or they're going to hear that truth, beauty, and goodness talk. And they're going to feel like that, hey, we people shouldn't, if, if they're outside of that box three, They've done something wrong. And if so, someone coming from a stage five faith says, bless them. And I'm grateful that stage three works for them. I truly am. But for the people that I work with on a daily basis who are struggling and who want to be loved by their parents or by their community, um, by their siblings, and they have maybe hit that stage four faith where they feel like there are things because of their own individual experiences that don't work for them in that stage three box, and so they are, they're looking to kind of feel connected or to feel answers. Um, those are the people that oftentimes are going to hit that stage four. And what they need is that love and compassion. But it can be hard when it's when someone truly does feel like that stage three faith, that all-encompassing belief system, that that is the only way to go. So that's where that they oftentimes three and four can butt heads. So my job is to try to just get people to the stage five faith. Where, uh, you know, I had somebody the other day say, isn't it the old, can't we all just get along? And in a sense, it is more from, from a Christ-like love. Um, and this is the part where, hey, I've already talked about Christianity. I've already talked about Christ. I mean, if you've listened to my interview I did on leading saints, which I really encourage because um, we cover, you know, you know, we cover a lot of this stuff that has to do with the shame, the guilt, the how we all in, in grow up individually. But this is the part where, uh, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of religion. I was kind of uh, late to the to the party, so to speak, in my early 20s. And so I know that it's not as natural for me. And that's why I struggle with the, the truth claims necessarily. You know, when someone and when I do this talk, I often I often refer to 
there was a while where when I was even teaching this early morning seminary class where I didn't even want to go into one of these uh, Sunday school classes because people would say, oh, uh, you know, Tony knows all about the scriptures. He teaches seminary. And I, and I, I didn't, I wasn't in that stage five place yet at that time where I could say, Hey, actually Tony doesn't know a whole lot. See how I just refer to myself in the third person. That's a red flag right there. But I would have said, Hey, no, I, I don't, you know, that's the whole thing. I can read this stuff like three or four times in a row and I still won't necessarily remember the concept, but I'm a beauty guy. I feel it. You know, I know it. I feel it in my bones. I, I, and, and it inspires me to hear these, uh, these faith promoting stories and, uh, and that's what I love. And I'm willing to accept that. And if someone says, well, you should, you know, be able to uh, recite scripture in verse or whatever, then, well, I, hey, I'm so glad that that's where you're at and that that's important to you. And, uh, and again, I, I'm so grateful for that. But for me, um, this is kind of the way I work. And from a purely empathetic standpoint, whether it's my, my DNA, whether my brain doesn't want to remember scriptural things, or uh, whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the place that I'm at in my faith journey. But back to that concept of the atonement. That's why as a therapist, um, if there's anything now that I really, really attach to is just this concept of the atonement. That again, if you are one who believes, um, you know, comes from a Christian belief system and you do believe in that atonement of Christ and where he did, if he did, you know, uh, die for everyone's not just sins, but sorrows, griefs, pains, loneliness, and that he understands what, what all of that is about, that he truly does is the master of empathy and has walked in our shoes. Um, that's the part I get to see in therapy. People come to me and, and no two are even remotely close. Even though I get to hear the similar stories on a day-to-day basis, man, um, go back to that nature, nurture, uh, DNA, birth order, um, attachment patterns, abandonment issues, just situational places where somebody puts themselves out and somebody isn't there for them. Or even if we go back to the EFT concepts where if somebody says, hey, I'm struggling with this and a well-intentioned parent or, or church leader says, hey, don't worry about it. You know, you really, you're a good person and I've struggled too. And, and you just need to, you know, push on through. That is so well-meaning, but not empathetic. It's not saying, tell me more about what your experience is because I want to know because there's no possible way that I can completely understand but I'm right here beside you and I want to be by you and I want to be with you. And so if you really believe in that concept of the atonement, that's kind of where, where, you know, we're coming from, from where Christ is right there beside us, the absolute master of empathy. And so that's why when we do feel like then someone is willing to, to judge um, others, why it can be so difficult because we feel like, well, wait a minute, nobody, you really don't know exactly what I'm going through. So, I could go on, but I, I'm grateful for you uh, that you spent the time with me today to talk about navigating a faith journey, a faith crisis. I hope this is one that you might feel comfortable enough to pass along to those who may have people in their lives who are struggling with their own faith, or you might pass along to people, um, parents who maybe have kids or, or young adults who have struggled with their faith, and uh, just kind of look from this ultimate uh, example of empathy um, then how we all identify with these different areas of truth and beauty and goodness. And those all come from who we are. And then how do we, how do we navigate through a faith crisis, a faith journey? And I really believe James Fowler's stages of faith is a really solid model where for that person, and here's the, again, I didn't say this at the time, but the person who's kind of outside, who's already kind of moved past that stage three, three faith, or they've kind of gotten outside of that box, so to speak, um, it's a little bit of that, you know, hard to kind of put them back in the box. So the best thing we can do is have empathy and uh, try to, to try to look at things from that stage five conjunctive faith. Um, but uh, but my my hope, my prayer, my um, my true desire is uh, it really is that stage five mentality. Of, Can't we all just get along? Um, life's a little bit too short, and uh, there there you know there are a lot of tools and ways to kind of communicate out there that really can bring families together, even when they are at different places in the stages of faith, or even when they don't identify together as uh, whether it's from a truth standpoint, beauty or goodness. And, uh, and that's really my hope or my prayer that, uh, that we can all just use these, all of these concepts to grow closer together um, and edify each other, because that's the way that we can really raise our collective emotional baselines and be better people that, uh, that help in our families, our communities, and we'll just kind of make this whole world a little bit better a place. So until next time, I'll see you again on the Virtual Catch. Compressed emotions flying past, our heads and out the other end, the pressures of the day.
daily grind is wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the midnight hour They push aside the things that matter most It's wonderful Strengths and 